السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم تسليما ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي My brothers can come a little bit closer inshallah Our next sahabi is Abdullah bin Jahash رضي الله تعالى عنه A brief overview of Abdullah bin Jahash رضي الله تعالى عنه and who he was he was from the same tribe as the Sahabi who was one of our shining stars we mentioned earlier, uh, Uqasha bin Mihsan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the tribe of Banu Asad. So Abdullah bin Jahash and Uqasha bin Mihsan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, both were from the same tribe, so they were related to each other. Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu ta'ala anhu also happened to have two relations with the Blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's father, Abdullah, and Abdullah bin Jahash, as his, his mother, Umayma bint Abdul Muttalib, were both brothers and sisters. So, she, so he was, Abdullah bin Jahash was the Blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's cousin from the paternal side. Father's sister's son. Also, his sister, Zainab bint Jahash radiallahu ta'ala anha, was one of the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, one of the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he also had the honor of being a brother-in-law to the Blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was one of the only families in Makkah Mukarramah in which all the immediate members of the family accepted Islam. So both his brothers Abu Ahmad and also Ubaidullah and his sister Zainab bint Jahash uh, accepted Islam. I'm sorry, it was in Makkah Makarma, wherever they lived in Banu Asad. But uh, Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu ta'ala who eventually did move to Makkah Makarma and he bought his house there. So he originally was from Banu Asad. But since Banu Asad, as we mentioned at the, when we were talking about Kasha bin Mahsan, was a ally of Quraysh. So many of the tribe members of Banu Asad lived in Makkah Makarma. Abdullah bin Jahash was one of them. So he lived in Makkah Makarma, Zainab bin Dijahash lived in Makkah Makarma, and both his brother Ubaidullah and Abu Ahmad both lived in Makkah Makarma. And they were among those who migrated to Abyssinia and then from there to Medina Munawwara. His younger brother Ubaidullah was married to another wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ummi Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha. Ummi Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha was the daughter of Abu Sufyan who was one of the chiefs of Quraysh. But Ubaidullah did not remain Muslim, he renounced Islam. When he went to Abyssinia, which was a Christian country, and he had a habit of drinking alcohol. So when he went to Abyssinia, he saw that he had all these opportunities to drink and then at the same time be amongst the people of the book, and they have been praised in Islam. So he thought of turning towards renouncing Islam, and he renounced Islam. The day bef before Ummi Habiba radiallahu anha found out about his death, she saw a dream that night. She saw her husband in a very grotesque form, very scary form. And she woke up and that morning she found out that her husband had renounced Islam. After that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her. So this was Ubaidullah. And then he had another brother, Abu Ahmad. But initially all of them accepted Islam and moved to Abyssinia, migrated there together. He is one of the Sabiqoon al awwalun the Sabiqoon al awwalun In other words, those people who accept Islam in the very, very beginning, which means also that they suffered a lot of persecution because those who accept Islam earlier, they always faced a lot of hardship at the hands of Quraysh. Some more, some less. Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu ta'ala was one of the Sabiqeen and he actually accepted Islam even before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa moved to the house of Arkham, which we have spoken of many times. If any one of us have been to Medina Munawwara, we all go, when we go to visit the different historical sites, we go to visit the, the battle places like Jabal al-Uhud and where Rasulullah fought. One of the other places we go to visit is the grave of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Hamza radiallahu anhu was the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and we talked about Wahshi ibn Harb before the one who killed him and slayed Hamza bin, uh, 
Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, we talked about him in detail, the beloved uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the place where he's buried, Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu ta'ala is buried in the exact same place. All the Sahaba who were martyred in the battle of Uhud, all of them are buried in a separate place, and Hamza and Abdullah bin Jahash are buried in one grave. We should remember one thing, that where Hamza and Abdullah bin Jahash are buried today, when you go to Medina Munawwara, you see their grave, that's not the same place where they were originally buried after they were martyred. And during the time of Amir Muawiyah, he saw a dream in which Hamza radiallahu complained to him about water coming into his grave. And he complained about it. Thereafter, Amir Muawiyah didn't give the order to have their graves dug. So Amir Muawiyah and Abdullah bin Jahash, both their graves were dug and they found that the water was leaking in from flooding because it was in a valley where a lot of water would come when there would be a lot of rainfall. So then their graves were moved to the present site where their graves are now. Which is not too far. But Abdullah bin Jahash then has the honor of also being buried with Hamza radiallahu anhu. And he's not buried with the other Sahaba who were martyred in the battle of Uhud. When he passed, when he was martyred in the battle of Uhud, he did not leave any family behind besides his sister. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became his heir. And he took over all the wealth that he had left behind, which he in the battle of Khaybar, which took place in the seventh year of Hijrah, spent that money on buying a real estate in Khaybar, which he later gave to Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu ta'ala anhu's son. So he basically invested for Abdullah bin Jahash's son radiallahu ta'ala He did not take any of that money and use it on uh, the Sahaba or gave it to the Fuqara and the Masakin as he usually did. He had extra money, he'd give it away right away. But this, he actually invested for his son. So when his son grew up, after the battle of Khaybar, he uh, gave that land over to him. He's known by the title of Mujadda Fillah. This is why he was known as by the Sahaba Ridwan Allah Majman because of an incident that took place in the battle of Uhud, which he's famous and known by. Mujadda uh, Afillah. What does that mean? Mujadda means the one whose nose was cut in the name of Allah. His name was cut in the name of Allah. So whenever the Sahaba called him, they didn't say Abdullah bin Jahash, they say Mujadda Afillah. The one whose nose was cut for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, we'll talk about that incident now. In the battle of, before the battle of Uhud took place, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala who narrates in a hadith that Abdullah bin Jahash came to me and he said, come, let's make dua. If we make dua together, there's more likelihood of it being accepted. When you make dua separately, inshallah will be accepted. But when you make dua collectively, there's more chances of it being accepted. Because, think about it. If one person's dua is going to be accepted, then everyone's will be accepted. And if there's one person alone praying on his own, if his dua is not accepted, his dua is not accepted. But if there's 50 people, there's 20 people, anyone's dua is accepted, because of him, everybody else's dua is accepted. So even if your dua was not initially accepted, because of the dua of someone else, your dua will also be accepted. Something to think about. So Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu anh, came to Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, he said, I, want to, I feel like making dua. But I don't want to make dua alone. I want to make dua with you, so that when I make dua, you can say ameen, and when you make dua, I say ameen. Bismillah. So they went off on the side from the battlefield, and Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu ta'ala who said to him, let's make dua. So they went, and Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala started making dua. He said, Ya Rabb, Tomorrow, oh my, ro- oh my Lord, tomorrow, إِذَا لَقِيتُ الْعَدُوَّةِ When I meet the enemy, فَلَقِّنِي رَجُلًا شَدِيدًا بَأْسُهُ شَدِيدًا Meet me, or make me come face to face in the battlefield with a man who's very strong and extremely good fighter, a good warrior. أُقَاتِلُهُ وَيُقَاتِلُنِي He fights me and I fight him. We duel against each other. And then give me power over him and make me victorious. In other words, I kill him. 
حَتَّى أَقْتُلَهُ وَآخُذَ سَلَبَهُ Until I kill him and I take his spoils, so his armor and whatever he owns. فَأَمَّنَا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنْ جَحَشْ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنْ جَحَشْ رَدِّي اللَّهِ سَدْ آمِين When we recite Surah Fatiha, we say Amin after that. Why do we say Amin after that in the Jama'ah? Some people say it loudly, according to different madhaib, some say it quietly, but we should always say it. We should always say it. Why? Because Rasulullah has mentioned in a hadith that when a person, when in a Jama'at, people say Amin, they say it with the angels, their dua is immediately accepted. Because right after Surah Fatiha, the angels say, Ameen. And if your Ameen is with the Ameen of the angels, your dua will be accepted. What is the dua? Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Show us the straight path. So it's a time of acceptance of dua when your Ameen becomes one with the Ameen of the Malaika. It's a very special time. Therefore, we should always make sure we say Ameen. So our Ameen is in the chorus of the Ameen of the angels. So he said, Ameen. Then Abdullah bin Jahsh radiallahu ta'ala anhu raised his hand. He said, Allahumma rizukni rajulan shadeedan. Oh Allah, give me the tawfiq, the ability to meet a man tomorrow who is a fighter, powerful and strong. Uqatiluka, uqatiluhu feek wa yuqatiluni. He fights me and I fight him. Thumma ya'khudhani. And then he takes hold over me. In other words, he dominates in this duel. فَيَجْدَعُ anfi, And he kills me. And then he cuts my nose وَأُذُنِي And my ears. So he kills me. He's looking for martyrdom now. That I die. Forget about my family. Forget about my mother. Forget about my, all my desires, my hopes. The Sahaba didn't have desires for the future. Their desire was only one thing. To please Allah and His Rasul Wasallam. They never had any other. We can't think along those lines because we have so many distant hopes. I gotta do this. I have so many things to do. I have so many people to take care of, so many responsibilities. Let me do all those things first. Sahaba never had distant hopes. So he says he kills me and he cuts my nose and he cuts my ears. Then what? Tomorrow, Ya Allah, when I meet you on the day of judgment, you say to me, Ya Abdullah, Man jada'a anfak wa udhunak? Who cut your ears and who cut your nose? I will say, Fika wa fi rasulik. I will tell him who cut it and I will tell him it was cut for you and your messenger. I did it solely for your sake. This, this nose being cut and these not having ears, this is a sign of my love for you and the love for your Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you will say, Sadaqta, you speak the truth. And then you will send me into Jannah. So Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala who said, the next day on the battlefield, both our du'as were accepted. That night, I saw his nose and his ears put into a necklace. That's how they used to do in those days. I saw his nose and his two ears made into a necklace. And I thought, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his dua was much better than my own. He's probably sitting, he's sitting in Jannah right now, and I'm here. Sayyid ibn Musayyib rahimahullah used to say about this incident. He used to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the first part of his dua. Inshallah, Allah will accept the second part of his dua too. First part of his dua was the martyrdom. Second part of his dua was coming in front of Allah and Allah asking him, who cut your nose and why? And he will say, for you and your Rasul, ya, ya Allah. And you, and you will say, yes, you spoke the truth. And then because of that, you will put me into Jannah. Without hisab, no reckoning involved. Just send me straight in. So because of this, he was called Mujadda Filla, The one whose nose was cut for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is one Sahabi we talked about previously. And I'm forgetting who it was. Maybe one of you can remind me. In the battle of Uhud, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi gave him a sword and that, uh, sorry, he gave him a date palm tree, a branch of a date palm tree in his hand and it became a sword. Exact same miracle happened in the exact same battle with Abdullah bin Jahsh. That Sahabi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his sword's name was Al-Aun, the helper. 
Remember, this Sahabi, his Abdullah bin Jahash, when his sword broke while he was fighting, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave him that date palm tree and the 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 branch of a date palm tree, and it turned into a sword, and then that sword became known by the name of Al Urjoon, the branch of a date palm tree, Al Urjoon. After Abdullah bin Jahash was martyred, it was sold for 200 dinar, which one means 200 pieces of gold. One piece of gold was equivalent to about three quarters of an ounce. One ounce nowadays is equivalent to about 16 to 1700 dollars. You can imagine if it was for 200 dinar, how much his sword was sold for and how much inheritance must have come to his family because of that sword. And the reason why was because it was a very special sword, Al-Arjun. He's also known for another very famous incident. He's called the first Amir, the first leader. He's called the first leader. Or you could say the first commander. Because after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi migrated to Medina Munawwara, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent out an expedition about seven months after the migration, before the Battle of Badr. And he made the leader of this, he made the leader of this expedition, Abu Baid ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu But his son came and he started crying, his little son. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's heart melted and he said to Abu Baid, go home, I'm not going to make you the commander. Take care of your son. Then he appointed Abdullah bin Jahash to lead this expedition. This expedition consisted of only 12 men. One of them was the Sahabi Amr ibn Fuhira, the one who rose to the sky. He's one of our shining stars. One was Ammar bin Yasir. He's not one of our shining stars, but he's a very great, well-known Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the, uh, from the Muhajireen, from the emigrants, and two, three other very well-known Sahaba who participated and who were among these 12 Sahaba in this expedition. Abdullah bin Jahash was made the Amir, the commander of this expedition. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him a piece of paper and he closed it up for him and told him that go to this and this valley and when you reach that valley after two days, then open up the letter and whatever it says, then you fulfill that command. But don't force anyone to it. If any one of the people from your expedition want to turn back and go back to Medina Munawwara, they can. But remember, don't touch anyone. Don't kill anyone. This purpose of this trip is only to collect information about the people of Makkah. That's it. That was the only purpose behind this expedition. Collect information. So he went. Two days later, they arrived at that valley. He opened the letter and in it, the order was given that arrive at the Batan Nakhla. Batan Nakhla was a valley that was very close to Makkah Mukarramah. And the purpose was to watch out and see how many caravans were going in and how many caravans were going out. So he told all the people in his expedition, listen, the Blessed Prophet ﷺ specifically told me not to force anyone to join this expedition. This is what the command is. If you want to come, you may come with me if you want to stay. Uh, if you want to go back, you can return back to Medina Munawwara. All of them agreed that we will stay. So they stayed in the, they came to this valley where Surah ordered them to stay and a caravan were coming and going. There was one caravan that was coming, a trade caravan that was coming from Ta'if, which is a city very close to Makkah Mukarramah, consisting of a group of men. And this was the last day of the month of Jamadul Akhar. Or it was the first day of Rajab. Remember, it went by the moon. So it could be the 29th of Jamadi al ukhra and the first of Rajab. Or it could be the 30th of Jamadi al ukhra So Rajab is considered one of the honorable, honored months. There's four months that are called Ashhur al Hurum, the month of respect, the month of reverence. And in those four months, the Arabs did not fight. Nobody would raid a caravan. No one would attack another tribe. They stayed away from all that stuff in these four months. They were Muharram, Rajab, Dhul Qa'da, and Dhul Hijjah. Dhul Hijjah is the month in which people come to perform the Hajj in Makkah Mukarramah. So they saw this caravan coming from Taif entering into Makkah and they consulted each other 
they looked at the time. They saw it's the last day of Jamaadul Akhir. Okay, we can. And they agreed that we should attack it for whatever reason. They forgot what Rasulullah told them. They attacked it. They killed one person. They took hostage, uh, captive two people. Hakam ibn Kaysan was one of them. We will talk about him a little bit later. And they came back bringing all the stuff from the caravan. It was a lot of wealth. When they came back to Medina Munawwara, they gave the two captives, Abdullah bin Jahash gave the two captives to Rasulullah and plus the spoils of war he presented to him. And Rasulullah was extremely angry because he had given him the order not to touch anyone, just to collect information. And Rasulullah turned his back on Abdullah bin Jahash and the Sahaba. And because the, all the Sahaba in Medina Munawwara boycotted them, they refused to talk to them, they didn't want to hear them. And they themselves started thinking that we're destroyed today. We're in big trouble. On top of that, it turned out that it was not the last day of Jamadiul Akhar, it was actually the first day of Rajab. So they had actually violated this respected month of Rajab. Nobody fought in the month of Rajab. And here, these men of Muhammad وسلم, became famous amongst all the Arabs. Oh, the men of Muhammad, they have no respect for these four months and they fought and attacked a caravan. So Rasulullah was extremely hurt by that as well. Extremely hurt. The Sahaba themselves, Abdullah bin Jahash, were very, very sad and they thought, okay, now we're going to be destroyed. And I is going to be revealed upon us and Rasulullah is angry and we're in big trouble, we're going to be destroyed. But instead, just the opposite ayah was revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ قِتَالٍ فِيهِ قُلْ قِتَالٌ فِيهِ كَبِيرٌ وَصَدٌّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَكُفْرٌ بِهِ وَالْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ أَكْبَرُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَكْبَرُ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ When the Quraysh found out that this was the first day of Rajab, they sent some men to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and they made a big deal in the Arabian Peninsula about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doesn't have any respect for the four months. As I have any respect for the four months because they wanted to make him look bad in the eyes of the Arabs. This was their opportunity. So they spread the propaganda. And they actually sent men to Medina Munawwara saying that your men attacked our caravan in the month of Rajab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah. They ask you about the four months of four months, the respected months. Tell them. Fighting in these four months and killing someone is very, very big sin. But, but, to stop people from the path of Allah. Referring to Rasulullah being in Makkah Makarma and they're persecuting him and not allowing him to propagate the deen. And disbelief in Allah and not allowing people to enter Masjid al Haram and pray to Allah the way he should be prayed. وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِي مِنْهُ أَكْبَرُ وَإِنْدَ اللَّهِ And to exile people when they believed in one Allah from Makkah Mukarramah, the holy city, the sacred precinct, is even worse, is even more major sin than this. So don't make such a big deal out of this. If they committed a major sin, you committed an even more major sin with your disbelief, with your t- exiling Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi and the Sahaba from Makkah Mukarramah and from stopping people to pray to Allah subhanahu wa taala. When this ayah was revealed, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi called Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu and he took the captives and he also took all the spoils of war and sp- distributed amongst them. And one of those captives, Hakam bin Abi Kaysan, he presented Islam to him. He accepted Islam and he became one of those people who was massacred in the well of Ma'una where Amr ibn Fuhayra, his body was raised to the sky. So Amr ibn Fuhayra was a part of this expedition and he was attacked this caravan. One of the people from this caravan, Hakim ibn Kaysan, became later one of the, his, his, uh, the members or one of the group of 70 people who died with Amr ibn Fuhayra and was martyred in the well of Bi'r Ma'una, that area of Bi'r Ma'una, in which Amr ibn Fuhayra's body was raised to the skies. SubhanAllah. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them brothers later on. 
This is why he was known as the first commander of Islam. This is Abdullah bin Jahash. As you mentioned, he was martyred in the Battle of Uhud. Second Sahabi, Zayd bin Sahal, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This, he is not known by his name. He is known by his agnomen. As I told you in the very beginning, some Sahaba became known by their names and some were known by their agnomen. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu was known by his kunya. Abu Bakr, not by his name, Abdullah bin Tuhafa. Zayd bin Sahal, on the other hand, was not known by Zayd bin Sahal. So that's why some people are asking me, I don't know who this is. But maybe if you hear his kunya, you'll remember, or maybe you've seen his, in his name in the narration, because he's a narrator of many, many ahadith. His kunya was Abu Talha al-Ansari, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he was married to a woman who was even more famous than him. Because he accepted Islam because of her. She said to him, until you don't become Muslim, I am not going to marry you. And if you accept Islam, I will make the dowry that you're supposed to give me your Islam. So you accept Islam, that will be considered my dowry. And you don't have to give me anything. She sent a message to him. You're a very good man. And I'd love to marry you, but you're not a Muslim. I'm Muslim, you're a kafir. So first you have to accept Islam. If you accept Islam, my dowry will be your Islam and I don't want anything else from you. This was Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala anha. She was the, the mother of who? Anas bin Malik radiallahu anha. Very, very famous habi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Anas bin Malik radiallahu anha. So therefore, in this chapter of talking about Zayd bin Sal, Umm Abu Talha radiyallahu we're also going to talk about Umm Sulaim because his life is intertwined with her life. Because his acceptance of Islam and becoming a Sahabi of Rasulullah was through her. So, it's not possible to talk about him without talking about her. Who was Abu Talha radiyallahu ta'ala anhu? He's from the tribe of Banu Najjar. Today, today, where the dome, the green dome is under which the grave of the Blessed Prophet ﷺ is. Where the hujra or the house of Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha is. That whole area, that whole area was the settlement of the, of the clan of Banu Najjar. You remember when you were talking about Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu anha, he was from the tribe of Banu Aus. Banu Aus. Banu Aus had many clans. One was the clan of Banu Abdul Ashhal, which was the clan of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh. And then there was a the clan of Banu Najjar. Banu Najjar was the clan of Abu Ayyub Ansari, the house at which Rasulullah stayed when he first migrated to Medina Munawwara for a couple of days until his own house and the Masjid the Nabi was made. And Banu Najjar was also the clan of Abu Talha al Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We should remember one very important thing. Historically speaking, this is something for us to remember. It's also very interesting. Banu Najjar, all the people from the tribe of Banu Najjar, are from the clan of Banu Najjar, are related to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's a direct relation. Now you would ask, why would there be a relation? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was from Mecca, and Banu Najjar was a tribe in Medina Munawwar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's grandfather, what was his name? Huh? His grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. His grandfather's father's name was Hashim. Hashim. People of Quraysh were traders and they went for business to different places. Hashim once went on his way to Syria. He dropped, over, uh, dropped off at Medina Munawwara and he saw a woman there by the name of Salma. She was very beautiful. He fell in love with her. He asked her hand for marriage and she accepted. And with her, he had a child. When he was returning on his way back, he came back to Makkah Mukarramah and he told his, he brought his family with him. He brought his family with him and his child. And then he went on another business trip and dropped him off at Medina Munawwara. And then he left. But he never returned because he died on his way back before he could return back to Medina Munawwara. The name of that son was, the name of that son was, Al-Muttalib. In reality, his name was not Muttalib. 
Hashim had told his brother Abdul Muttalib, or sorry, had told his brother Muttalib that remember, I have a son who's in Medina Munawwara. Please make sure you pick him up. So Muttalib went all the way to pick up his nephew from Medina Munawwara. And when he was bringing him back to Makkah Mukarramah on their way back, the nephew was sitting behind, Muttalib was sitting ahead. Now this was not the son of Muttalib, this was the son of Hashim. But since he was sitting behind Muttalib, he became known as Abdul Muttalib. The servant of Muttalib. But he was not the servant of Muttalib, he was the servant of Hashim. Or the son of Hashim. Salma was from the tribe of Banu Najjar. So, sometimes when Rasulullah was with a child, his mother Amana, when she used to go to Medina Munawwara, she used to stay with the tribe of Banu Najjar. So Rasulullah knew them as a child. And when Rasulullah migrated to Medina Munawwara, we know, where did he stay? Where did his camel take him? He stopped in front of the house of Abu Ayyub Ansari, who was from the clan of Banu Najjar. So there is a, a relationship, a maternal relationship going back two, three generations between Banu Najjar and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Abu Talha Radilan from the maternal side was also related to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is something important for us to know. Once Abu Talha Radilan ta who came to meet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he was on his deathbed in the last few days and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, أَقْرِئْ قَوْمَكَ السَّلَامِ فَإِنَّهُمْ أَعِفَّةٌ صُبْرٌ Give the salams on my behalf. Give the salams on my behalf to your people. This could mean two things. Either the clan of Banu Najjar or the Ansar. The helpers of Ansar. Because you are a people أَعِفَّةٌ Very pure. Effaced. People who have given themselves up for Allah. And number two, صُبْرٌ very steadfast, very patient. He was either talking about Banu Najjar or he was talking about the whole group of Banu Aus, Banu Khazraj, those who are, became the helpers or the Ansar of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some things about Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, a question came about how to dig his grave. Because in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, graves were dug in two ways. One was shak and one was lahad. Shak is how we do graves here. Where we just dig a grave straight down and a smaller hole is made and the body is placed in that smaller hole and then you place some things over it like a piece of wood or unbaked bricks and then you put the dirt on top. That's one way, that's called a shak. The second way is lahad where you play you make a grave and then in the air in the on the direction facing the qibla you make a niche that goes inside and then you take the body down and you place the body in that niche that is exactly how rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is buried that is how rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is buried so for example, if you were to look down, you would not actually see the body because it's inside that niche. When Rasulullah passed away, the question came up amongst the Sahaba, especially amongst the Muhajirin and Ansar, how to make his grave. The Muhajirin, the Makkans, when they used to make graves, they used to make it shak, straight down, no niche. And the Ansar, when they used to make graves, they used to make a niche because there was a difference in the, uh, the earth, the earth in Makkah Mukarramah and the type of dirt and mud in Medina Munawwara. So the Sahaba couldn't decide. And because of that, they thought, they decided that we will call both people. The one who makes the shak in Makkah Mukarramah, Abu Abayd ibn Jarrah, and the one who makes a lahad in Medina Munawwara, Abu Talha Ansari. We will call them. Whoever comes first, we will do accordingly. So they called Abu Bayd al-Jarrah and they called Abu Talha Ansari and Abu Talha Ansari arrived first and therefore they decided that they're going to make the grave of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi with a lahad. And therefore that is exactly how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi is buried with a lahad. 
since there's no hadith on this, this was the only way for them to decide. This was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it was decided that, okay, whoever comes first, that's how we will decide how we're going to make the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Talha Ansari radiya anhu, one great thing about him was that he liked to fast a lot. He loved to fast. So, during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he could not fast too much. He would try to fast as much as possible, but because there were many military expeditions in which he had to join, and it was hard because you're on a journey and it's hot, so it's very difficult to fast, and you became weak if you had to fight, that would have an effect on him. So therefore, he would not fast as much during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it's known about him that after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, he fasted for 40 years continuous, except for five days of every year. 40 days continuous, oh, sorry, 40 years continuous, except for five days every year. The four days, one is the 10th of the Hijjah, 11th, 12th, and 13th, and then the one day of Eid al-Fitr, where it's not permissible to fast. As we mentioned previously regarding one of the shining stars, one of the narrations that he narrated. Abdullah bin Hudhafa radiallahu ta'ala. So for 40 years, he fasted continuously. This family, the family of Abu Talha Ansari, Umm Sulaim, Anas radiallahu ta'ala, they were a family of khadimeen. They served Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They liked to serve Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a lot. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because of that, gave them a very special place. They had a very special place in the eyes of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he would often ask them to do some of the jobs that he wouldn't just give to anyone. One of the things that he gave Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu to do was that whenever he went for Umrah or for Hajj, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do the halaq, shave the hair, he would give Abu Talha the responsibility of distributing his hair to the people. Because everybody wanted his hair. So he would say to him, Aqsim Hubayn al Nas, distribute my hair to the people. And this is proof of the permissibility of keeping baraka, blessings of our elders. Blessing of somebody who's a wali of Allah, who's close to Allah, to keep his blessing. There's proof behind this in this. Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam used to give his hair out through Abu Talha that the, distribute this. Aqsimu bin nas Distribute this amongst the people and he would distribute it amongst the people. And the Sahaba, what they would do is, we know about some Sahaba, that they would keep that hair in a little jar or in a little bottle and they would mix it with water. Anybody would come sick, they would give that water to him and he would get shifa by the blessing of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's hair. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a shifa. Anybody who accepted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, weren't they saved from the fire? They were saved from the hellfire. It's the biggest shifa. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's hair was a form of shifa also. Also his wife, Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala anha. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would often, this is very rare, he would not do this with everyone. He would come sometimes and instead of sleeping in his own home in the afternoon, as was the habit, that he would always sleep in the afternoon. Qaylula as we call it, or siesta. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would, would sleep in the afternoon. Sometimes, instead of sleeping in his own home or in the homes of one of his nine wives, he would go to the home of Umm Sulaina, Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and sleep in their home in the afternoon. Because of his love for them, his relationship with them, his closeness to them. Like he was, like they were his own family. So once Rasulullah was sleeping, it was very hot and he was perspiring. And Umm Sulaim got this opportunity. She took a bottle and she was wiping off the perspiration and the sweat from his body. And he woke up and he said, Umm Sulaim, what are you doing? He says, I'm taking perfume from your body. Because the perspiration and the sweat from Rasulullah's body used to smell more sweet and more beautiful and fragrant than musk. So she would collect it while he was sleeping. It's very famous about her. Yaqilu indaha, he would perform his afternoon sleep in her house. فَكَانَتْ تَسْلُتُ عَرَقَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ فَتَطَيَّبُ بِهَا And she used to often uh, collect the sweat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and use it for perfume for herself. And it's known about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if he went through any alley in Medina Munawwara, People would know 
many, many hours even after he left, that Rasulullah has been through here because of the fragrance that he left. And the fragrance that he left was very distinct. It wasn't like the smell of any other fragrance. It was like the fragrance of Jannah. Because he was from the people of Jannah. As I mentioned, as I mentioned, when he was getting married to Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala anha, he was still a kafir, a disbeliever. So she sent him a message saying, Ma misluka bi raddin. A person like you should not be rejected. Walakinna kimrun kafir, but you are a kafir, you're a disbeliever, I cannot marry you. Because in Islam, a Muslim man can marry a non-Muslim woman. But a, not a Muslim woman cannot marry a non-Muslim man. You see, I've heard many stories of this happening now. This is not permissible in Islam. It's not permissible. وَلَكِنَّكَ إِمْرَأٌ كَافِرٌ You're a kafir. وَأَنَا مُسْلِمَا لَا تَحِلَّ لِي You're not permissible for me. فَإِن تَسْلِمْ فَذَلِكَ مَهْرِي If you accept Islam, that is my dowry. That's all I want from you. So he accepted Islam and that became her dowry. It's mentioned in a very famous narration that once her son, they had a child and the child passed away. He was very, very sick. So Abu Talha would come to the home and ask, how is he doing? Once he was away, the child passed away in his absence. And he came back from the journey. And Umm Salim radiallahu ta'ala anha did not want to put him in concern and give him the sad news right away. So she put the child away and she dressed herself up for her husband and he asked her, how is he doing? Oh, she said, she, he's in sukoon, he's in peace. He's gone to Allah, in other words. See, this is tawriya. Tawriya means a, something, a statement that can have a double meaning. One is its apparent meaning and one another meaning. He's in peace. In other words, he's gone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, mashallah, alhamdulillah, that's good. So she dressed up for him and that night he had a relationship with her. And then she said to him, she said, Abu Talha, when somebody gives you some money to borrow and there is a set time for her, you to return that money back to him, he comes and asks you for that money. Should you not give back that back to him or should you just say, no, no, I'm not going to give it back to you? He said, of course you should give it back to him. So he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a son and it was time for him to go back. So he's taken him back now. So Abu Talha was very saddened that why didn't you tell me before? I spent the night with you and then when I came you never told me and this child was dead in the house. Why didn't you tell me? But this was Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala anha's strength of character. Her devotedness to her husband. Her submissiveness to her husband. That her husband has come from such a long journey. She didn't want to put him in so much distress. This is what a good wife is like. Not that as soon as he comes home, you just spill out all your stories to him. So that he's tired and then on top of that, you let him have a little bit more. He goes through even more hardship. The purpose of the wife for the husband is sukoon. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So that you gain peace and tranquility through her. A very good wife. So they came to Rasulullah, he came to Rasulullah Sallallahu and he complained. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Umm Sulaim has done this. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made a dua. He made a dua for them. That, Barakallahu lakuma wa fi laylatikuma. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala put barakah in your night. Because of that, they had a son named Abdullah ibn Abi Talha. Abdullah ibn Talha, Abi Talha, had ten sons. Of those ten sons, every single one of them became a famous reciter of Quran and Hakim. One of them is very well known. His name was Ishaq ibn Abdullah ibn Abi Talha. He was one of the most famous reciters of Quran and Hakim in Medina Munawwara. This was the barakah of the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which tells us something very important too. That we should make our children reciters of Quran Hakim and scholars of Islam. Our first goal should not make them, you know, send them to university so they can make good money. That should not be our first goal. 
Look, the of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam accepted. What did they become? Something that pleased Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. This was blessing in their home. You have ten people in your home, all sons reciting Quran and Hakim beautifully and very well known. This was the barka of that dua. Unfortunately, nowadays learning the Quran and teaching the Quran is considered a menial thing, a low thing, something that's in fact considered degrading. The oh, you put your son in the Quran, he's memorizing Quran. He's wasting his time. This is how people think now. It's very common in our society. Very common. And here we see that Rasulullah made dua and the barakah of that that the grandchildren, all ten sons became reciters of Quran and Hakim. Ajeeb. Look at how our society and our thinking has changed. He had a very strong connection with the Quran and Hakim. I'm trying to finish this inshallah. It might take a few more minutes. He had a very strong connection with the Quran and Hakim. When he was much older, after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, this is the time when expeditions were being sent out, armies were sent, being sent out from Medina Munawwara, and they're conquering lands to the east, to the north, and to the west, all the way up to Egypt, to the north, the Byzantine, and to the east towards the Persian. They were conquering lands in large numbers. But Abu Talha was very old now. Once he was reciting Quran, this, this narration tells us about his connection to the Quran. He read the ayah, Infiru khifafa wa thiqala. Go in the path of Allah. Khifafa wa thiqala. With whatever little you have, or however much equipment you have. Whether you have a lot of equipment, or whether you have little equipment, just go in the path of Allah. This was, ayah was specifically for that time. He reinterpreted the ayah. Khifafa means light, meaning that you don't have that much on you. Still go out. Or thiqala, you have a lot on you, you're weighed down by your equipment, still go out. He reinterpreted the ayah, khifafan wa thiqala to mean shubbanan wa shuyukhan. Shubbanan meaning the young, the youth, or very light. And shuyukh, it's very hard for them. He was referring to himself. So he read this ayah, and he said, this is referring to the youth, and it's referring to me. So now I must go out, because it's the order of Allah. Infiru, go! So he said to his children, he said, Jahizuni, Jahizuni, get me ready, I have to go out on the path of Allah. How old was he? He's in his 80s now. I have to go on the path of Allah. Our father, your whole life, you're struggling in the path of Allah. You fought in all the expeditions. You fought in all the expeditions with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You participated in the battle of Uhud, and all the different battles. And then even after that, you've done your job. Don't worry now, you're old, you've been excused. He said, no, 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 jahizuni, jahizuni, get me ready. Get my stuff ready, I have to go. He said, da'ana, naqzu ank. I'll tell you what. His grandchildren told him, that I'll tell you what. We will take your place. We'll do it for you in your name. We'll go on the path of Allah in your name. So he said, no, no, I have to go out myself. Finally, he went out on an expedition on the seas. This was in the time of Amir Muawiyah The first naval expedition that went out was during the time of the Khilafah of Uthman Adilan. His, one of his governors was Amir Muawiyah. He took permission from Uthman Adilan to send out a naval expedition to Cyprus. He was in that expedition, that naval expedition, and he died on the ocean. In the ship. And they were in the middle of the ocean, could not find a place to bury him because they couldn't find any island or shore nearby. So they buried him seven days after he died. After seven days, they found land, they dropped over, and they dug a grave for him and buried him there. But the ajeeb thing is that his body did not decompose during those seven days. It remained in the exact same, same state as it was when he first passed away. So it was his karama. Abu Talha al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala. He was also an expert archer. An expert archer. Very good marksman. So when once in one of the battles with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was shooting arrows and Rasulullah was lifting his head to see where his arrow was falling. 
And Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala who saw that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has raised his head and he put himself in front as a shield to cover Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just in case an arrow strikes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, Hakada ya Rasulullah, like this ya Rasulullah, la yusibuka sahamun, I do not want an arrow to strike you. Nahri duna nahrik, my neck, not your neck. Wajhi li wajhik, my my face, my body, li wajhik al waqa, my body and my face for your face, my body for your body is a shield. Wa nafsi li nafsi al fida, and my my nafs. My soul, my being is a ransom for you, Ya Rasulullah. If an arrow strikes me, a javelin hits me, somebody strikes me with the sword, that's fine, but you should not be hurt. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sawtu Abi Talha fil jaysh khayram min fi'a. That the voice of Abu Talha in the battlefield is better than a whole group of men fighting in battle. This was Abu Talha al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala. There's one hadith that I would like to narrate inshallah about him. Once he says, I came, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I saw him, he was smiling. I had never seen him so happy in my life. His fate was glowing. And I said, Ya Rasulullah, ma ra'aytuka ala misli hadil hal. Abda, I've never seen you so happy in my life. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ma yamna'uni ya Abu Talha. What's stopping me, Abu Talha, from being happy today? قَدْ خَرَجْ جِبْرَيْلَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ مِنْ عِنْدِ يَعْنِفَا Jibreel alayhi salam just came to me a little while ago وَأَتَانِ بِبِشَارَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّي And he came to me with some very beautiful glad tidings. Give me some very good news. What was that good news? He said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَعَثَنِي إِلَيْكَ مُبَشِّرًا Allah has sent me to you to give you the good, inf- good news. أَنَّهُ لَيْسَ أَحَدٌ مِنْ أُمَّتِكَ يُصَلِّي عَلَيْكَ That no one will ever Send Salatu Salam upon you, Ya Rasulullah. Illa sallallahu azza wa jal wa malaikatuhu alayhi ashran. But Allah and His angels will send upon that person ten. <coughs> will send Salat upon that person who sent Salat upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ten times over. In other words, this was to show how exalted the status was in the eyes of Allah. That anyone who sent one salat salam upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so much that he would send salat upon him and forgive him and his rahmat would descend upon him ten times more. And not only Allah, the malaika as well. Imagine the love that Rasulullah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So really this was glad tidings for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showing how much Allah and His angels love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the extent that any movement Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made anything that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us that if you follow any movement that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made or did anything Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did even if he did it out of his person and not for a uh, purpose of establishing a ruling of Islam just he did it out of his person out of his person uh, his habit. You'll get reward for that. I will love you more. I just want to mention one or two things about Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala anha and then we'll finish inshallah. I have to mention these things. As I mentioned, her life, there's no life, there's no point in talking about Abu Talha radiallahu anha without mentioning Umm Sulaim. She was once passing by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I'm sorry, once when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ascended into the heavens, he saw her entering into her home, the palace that was made for her by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he gave her the glad tidings when he returned that I saw you in Jannah. You are from the people of Jannah. Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala anha. She was a woman that on the battlefield, she was the woman who would take care of the sick and the injured. Uh, she would take care of the injured people and those who were thirsty. So she would carry a water skin with her and have medicines on her and going from person to person, any person who was sick, any person who was uh, asking for water. And she always used to keep, her, keep a, a dagger with her all the time. That's why she was known by the title of Rumaysa, Rumaysa with a sad. She was known by that title because she always kept a dagger with her. Once Rasulullah asked her, Ya Muslim, why do you have this dagger on you? 
He said, Ya Rasulullah, any kafir comes to me and I'm going to stick it right in his love for Islam. How solid Muslim. Very strong in character. She was a widow before she married Abu Talha. People, when Rasulullah came after migration, were giving Rasulullah gifts of different sorts. She had nothing to give. She was a poor woman. She came with her little son. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, inna li khawaisa. I have one very special thing to give you. I have nothing else. Rasulullah said, What? She said, Ya Rasulullah, this is my little son. From now on, he is yours. So Anas became the special personal servant of Rasulullah who served him for 10 years and he's one of the narrators of the largest number of ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu made a special dua for this family that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put a lot of barakah in this family, made a lot of duas for this family. And as we mentioned, he had already seen in the ascension Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala anha in Jannah. So imagine the caliber and the level of this whole family, Abu Talha, Umm Sulaim, Anas radiallahu anha, and one more person, inshallah, who is from our shining stars, inshallah, who we will mention, inshallah, in a few days. Jazakumullah khayr. Subhanallah bihamdi. Subhanakallah bihamdi. Ishtu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa dubuli.